if you will, to categorise Honda as a car manufacturer. What do they specialise in making? Look around and you might think it's small and rather faceless family hatchbacks. But then again, they do make the Integra and now the Accord Type R, both full-on nutter machines. But there is a common factor here. Honda cars are discreet. It's not until you drive the Integra Type R up do you realise what it's all about. Look at it and it's just an ordinary hatch with a spoiler stuck on the back. And then there's the NSX, a car that takes being understated to the point of being, well, not very funny at all, really. Who wants to have a supercar that can outgun a Ferrari but looks like a Honda? And now it looks as though Honda's new baby is about to do to the two-seater roadster market what the NSX did to the supercar market. Nothing. The Honda S2000 isn't about to set anyone's knees at trembling on looks alone. An MX-5 is cuter, a Porsche Boxster more beautiful, and a BMW Z3 more sort of snarly. But it does have something. The metal looks like fabric stretched totally over shapes, defined by this big boxy grille at the front, these slanty headlights and these big bulgy wheel arches. It's distinctive, but understated. Honda, it seems, have taken the concept of the small two-seater roadster and they've got all sensible about it. They've tried to make it work as a car. They wanted to keep to a two-litre four-cylinder engine because it's light and compact and thanks to the VTEC system, very high revving. Also, being so compact, that means Honda could mount it a long way back under that long bonnet at the front. And that gives it the 50-50 weight distribution that fans of mid-engine supercars will tell you is what driving pleasure is all about. So we have here a rear-wheel driven two-seater open-top roadster with a 50-50 weight distribution and an engine that will happily rev to 9,000. Well, you just know it's got to be fun. And then they get really clever. By a combination of technical virtuosity and, I suspect, voodoo, Honda have managed to squeeze an incredible 240 brake horsepower out of that two-litre four-cylinder engine. Now, come on, chaps. That really isn't playing the game. I mean, a chap could hurt himself. Isn't that rather missing the point, though? We should know we're British and we've been blatting around in little two-seaters for decades. And we know that they should be cramped and reliable and outpaced by large family cars, but always beautiful and dashing. So what's all this talk of reliability, performance, handling? Come on, chaps, play the game. Mazda may have made their MX-5 indestructible, but it's certainly not overpowerful. And the Z3 in anything other than M-Tech form is just pure pose value. Honda then have decided to make their baby two-seater work in all departments. And then there's the price. Well, like anything else, the two-seater Roadster has gone up in price over the years. From being just a thing for a young gadabout to be seen spinning around town, it's become a plaything for the fat 50-something corporate gladiators to escape in at the weekend. At a shade under 28 grand, the S2000 is about 6,000 cheaper than your Porsche Boxster, but it outperforms it. People regularly spec up their Z3s until they cost around this, and the only ones cheaper are the Mazda MX-5 and Fiat Barchetta, neither of which are even in the same league when it comes to performance. Perhaps the only disappointment for the S2000 is the interior, which, once you get past the racy red leather sports seats and the extra deep transmission tunnel, which does give the car extra stiffness, it's all a bit bland, really. Some of the switch gear, though very sturdy, is a little on the flaky side, and I'm still not a big fan of the digital dash. And that exterior, I've come to like it. It's taut, purposeful and stylish, and I'm sorry for saying that it wasn't. It may take a while to realise it, but I think it looks fantastic. But it is very comfortable in here. And like the rest of the car, it feels very substantial and very well put together. But it's not for sitting around and gawping out. The idea is you're supposed to take it out, drive it, enjoy it, drive it quite fast. Now, hold on a minute. I've found a fault. Everything is not rosy after all, and it's this. You've pulled up to some beauty spot with a lady in your life. Look out at the view, and the moment arrives, and you lean across, darling. I wonder if I might steal a kiss. And is it me, or is it raining? Oh! It's the headlamp washer, the buttons, and you... <coughs> it's not cool. It's not cool at all. Quite embarrassing.
There is passion in the S2000, and it starts here with this button. It's big, it's red, and as it says, it starts the engine. And it's absolute proof that Honda are just a little bit proud of what they've done with this car. And justifiably so, they've taken the concept of the small two-seater roadster by the scruff of the neck and shaken it till its goggles fell off. They've produced a car that is tauter, stronger and faster than anything else in the class, and it does it all for less than anything else in the class. It still may not be a cheap toy, but it's a damn good one. There's no point in denying it. The coupe sector is the fashion end of the car industry. It's the shiny plastic handbag sector. It's a place where beauty is more than skin deep. It's an entire reason for being. And it's a place where we buy cars not for their performance or their ability, but for the way they look. It's a beauty parade. It's a complicated business. If you've got around 20 to 25,000 pounds burning a hole in the pocket of your jeans and you're looking for a car. If it's outright performance you want, then you're likely to be looking at something like Subaru's Impreza or the Mitsubishi Evo. If you want sports car thrills, then there are loads of little rear-wheel drive roadsters like the Mazda MX-5 or for a little more, Honda's new S2000. But no, you want a car that's a little more familiar, that echoes perhaps a more sensible choice but still stands out in the company car park. Though not too much, because it doesn't want to upset the bosses. In fact, what you want is a car that your fleet manager is going to let you have. Enter the BMW 3 Series Coupe. The two six-cylinder versions are first to be available, the 323 and the 328. The 318 with four cylinders is available in the autumn. The 323 confusingly has a 2.5-litre straight-six. This, the 328, has a 2.8-litre straight-six. Classic BMW engine, huge bucket loads of torque and a glorious straight-six bellow to accompany it. The driving position is neutral. You feel very much in command with all the controls exactly where they should be. A couple of criticisms, both to do with the steering, though. It's very precise and very direct and quite communicative, as you'd expect from a BMW. But it could do, I think, with a quicker rack. You do have to put in an awful lot to get a response. And this wheel is enormous. It's like driving a tractor. It could do with something a little bit smaller, just to make it feel like it's a little more eager to turn in. At the moment, it just follows the corners rounds rather than turns into the bends with vigor. And then it has a whole barrage of technological wizardry to help you avoid throwing the thing at the scenery. There's ASC plus T, ABS, SSC, the list goes on and on. Basically, we're talking traction control and probably one of the most advanced traction control systems on the market today. Bearing in mind this is a rear-wheel drive car with quite a lot of power, you could get into a little bit of trouble. And to illustrate the point of just how effective that traction control system is, try turning it off and then being a little over-enthusiastic with the right boot and you soon find things get a little bit naughty. There is a certain irony to this. The BMW 3 Series Coupe is, in its own right, a very good car, and it doesn't share a single body panel with its sister, the 3 Series Saloon version. And yet, despite the enormous expense and amount of engineering involved in achieving that, it's been designed to look, well, pretty much like the 3 Series Saloon, really. In fact, it's longer, lower and wider than the Saloon and than the previous Coupe, and it does have the same steeply raked front and rear windscreens that kind of define it as a Coupe shape. But it is all very elegant, and very understated. And the same can be said for the interior, where it's equally elegant and understated. And it's equally ironic that a car so often bought by the terminally brash should boast one of the most understated interiors on the market. Slide into the cockpit of any modern BMW, in fact, and you enter an environment designed to make you comfortable with maximum efficiency. Everything in the right place and everything built to last. Mind you, it's never going to win any prizes for being the most interesting place on earth to be. Standard equipment, though, is pretty good for the 3 Series Coupe. We've got electric seats on everything, air conditioning, safety has been given a high priority with six airbags in here, ABS, and a sophisticated traction control system, and plenty of goodies in the cabin to play around with as well, including electric windows front and rear, and there's little touches like this that can make all the difference.
The three series coupe accounts for a quarter of all UK sales in its sector, and that's a level of success you can't argue with. BMW must be getting something right with this car, and apart from the build quality and image, that probably starts with the combination of rear-wheel drive and strong engines. The straight six units are a real peach, and the 328 is a very fast peach indeed. Strong and tractable with plenty of power right through the rev range, it really is a joy to drive and feed the power through into those rear wheels. You would expect the 3 Series Coupe to be something of a special drive, and it doesn't disappoint. What we found was that our customers actually ordered lots of options on Coupe, much more so than the saloon variant. And so what we thought we would do with this one is give them what they actually wanted in the first place. But actually, in overall terms, when you take account of the additional specification, the car is actually better value than the old one. We came in in 92 with the, with the previous car, and it was the first proper coupe that we had built. And immediately, the market expanded. Um, and a lot of competitors have now followed us into that sector. So it's gone from around 16,000 units a year up to 30, 35,000 units a year, and we have 25% of that market. So we're actually, we've, we've actually, as you rightly say, have, have a, a fair stronghold on that market. And the, the principal reason we believe for that is that this coupe, perhaps even more so than its predecessor, is a very, very good mixture of style, because style's important in coupes, it has to look good, but also it's practical. BMW's philosophy is, has never been to be wild with its cars. Uh, it, it's an evolutionary styling, just as the saloon is. And I think that's, that's really because we've found a, a style which our customers like, a family style. And if we were to change that, actually we risk alienating a lot of our customers. The feedback we get from our customers is they like it. It's identifiable as a BMW. It's not an extreme car. You can park it and people are not sort of gawk, gawking at it all the time and perhaps making the, the occupants feel embarrassed. But it's a nice mixture between restrained style and, as I've said before, practicality. The new 3 Series Coupe will sell, and probably in enormous numbers. But when you think about it, for all the wrong reasons, for its pretty face, for its BMW badge, but if it looked like an old allotment shed and was labelled the Lumpy Doodah Coupe, it would still be worth a look. Its sheer ability would overcome such disadvantages. Sure, it might be in the fashion end of the motor industry, but to use a fashion statement, BMW would tell you that their design is a timeless classic. And you know, I don't think they'd be that far wrong. Oh, oh. Jimny, Jimny Cricket, wasn't that the name of some squeaky voice critter in a schmaltzy Walt Disney thing? I don't know. Anyway, in this context, Jimny is the name of Suzuki's little tiny off-roader, also a squeaky voiced wee critter. That's unfair, really. I mean, a 16-valve, 1.3-litre little engine is hardly likely to sound fruity and deep-chested, is it? At least it manages to chirp out about 79 bhp, which isn't bad, especially in a car weighing no more than a packet of fags. Trouble is, it's not much bigger than a packet of fags, either. Small is definitely what it's about here. And once you've got over that, well, it's not too bad. Some people buy their 4 befores for the commanding driving position, others for the sheer bulk, the sheer presence of them. Well, when I say others, I mean men who were bullied at school and neurotic women who seem to confuse the school run with Vietnam. But this is not one of those 4 befores. This doesn't so much loom up menacingly behind in your rearview mirror when you're sat in traffic as it sneaks up, taps you on the shoulder and says, excuse me, in a squeaky little voice. It certainly isn't a frightening vehicle. In fact, if you were to look in your rearview mirror, you might just catch a view of the top of the head of the person driving it, and that's about it. Unless you're going to work on a go-kart, of course. Really, to get into this thing, you've got to be smiling before you even climb on board, smiling before you drive it. And the fact that it looks so friendly helps there. So does this. I learnt this trick in a car park yesterday. Watch. Boom! Unusually, I'm going to tell you the price of this car early on, and that's because I reckon it's essential when you're assessing it as a purchase. And the reason is all Suzuki Jimny's come as standard with power-assisted steering, electric front windows, electric door mirrors, twin airbags, side impact bars. In fact, there's hardly anything you can really buy and spend your money on to add on to this as an optional extra. And so the price for these things, well, that's the really good news. For the manual gearbox version, it's £9,995 on the road. And for this, the automatic, 10870 Now that's super mini territory.
So comparing this with its competition, what can the Super Minis do that it can't? Well, you might say parking. In fact, it's a cinch in this. The turning circle is amazing. Driving is usually a good point in the Super Minis, just as it is in this. In fact, it's immense fun. Agreed, it does roll a little bit when it corners, and I can't say that I forgot entirely those disastrous toppling incidents of some of the earlier Suzuki Jeeps. But actually, they've sorted this so that the rear end will come round, and it's far more likely to swap ends before ever it'll roll over, which I'm sure is a kind of comfort somewhere. Super Minis are also economical, of course. Well, you can expect this to return over 34 miles per gallon average, 1.316 valve, you'd expect it to be pretty good for that. So in fact, there's very little. Boot space, perfectly reasonable. It's small, but then it's a small car. And even car makers have to obey the laws of physics. Looking at it another way then, what can this do that the Super Minis can't? Well, I'll tell you. We've got to leave it down here, and it can do this. We just changed into four wheel drive. It's even got a low transfer box. So if the going gets really bumpy, your little Suzuki Jimny can keep going. Now you do that in a super mini. I don't think so. I don't imagine it's going to pose a real threat to Land Rovers, Land Cruisers, and four tracks. But remember, Suzuki have been making mini leisure four befores now for 30 years, with the SJ, Samurai, and Vitara to their name. So they should have got the hang of it by now. David Hull is a stable manager and uses a variety of vehicles in his day-to-day -day work. All right, I'm a stable manager here. I do the day-to-day -day running of the yard, care of the horses. I usually use a quad bike for most of my daily chores. I don't use anything as grand as this. Um, but on the other hand, you quite often use a Range Rover towing a horse box to go to shows. It's not a bad little toy, really. Um, it's not going to pull many uh, huge loads. But it's not a bad little toy. You know the good thing about this little baby, it's got plenty of leg room. I'm six foot and I've got plenty of stretchy room here. Well, it might be a bit of a lightweight and it might have somewhat excessive noise at motorway speeds, but it feels well put together. Most of it's made from galvanized steel, so it should last forever anyway. If you're looking for a budget four by four for 10 grand, you might want to consider buying second hand and getting something perhaps a little more substantial. But if you're in the market for a second car or just for a small car that's got ample room in the back that looks a little bit different and that also means come the winter snows, you certainly will not be stuck, then I'd say this has got to be on your list. I know it'd be on mine. Oh, isn't it gorgeous? Just look at it. Brand new today. The way the, the circle is just, you know, well, round and the, the points, they, they meet the edges perfectly there. It's even got a little, a little stick here. It kind of wobbles on its little stick. It's just beautiful. Oh, and you get, um, you get one of these as well. Car. It is, in fact, the new Mercedes C-Class. And whereas its bigger brother, the S-Class, which this does look suspiciously like, is more likely to find itself living in a place with a drive, well, rather like this one, the C-Class is one strictly for suburbia. Traditionally, Mercedes have not been aimed at the likes of me. I get bored of anything within six months, cars, three months. Mercedes are traditionally aimed at people who keep them for millennia. In fact, Mercedes are delighted to say that they've got about 3,000 orders already taken for this car before it goes on sale and before the people who are buying it have even seen it. That's because they've always bought Mercedes and they always will buy Mercedes, whatever they're like. You could put Mercedes on your old Coke can and sell it. Now, I know it's still the budget end of the Mercedes range, but there is something very comforting about knowing that you're sitting in a car that is no bigger than a Mondeo and actually needn't cost that much more than a top-end one, but it's better built than your house and will probably be around a lot longer. It's actually longer than the previous C-Class, but because of its shape, it looks smaller, more compact, and that is translated in the drive. Whilst not exactly feeling tiny, it does feel a lot more nimble than the outgoing model. And it is a vaguely sporting experience. I say vaguely because, well, don't expect it to romp away madly. Easy choice of engines. This is the 200, which means it gets a two litre with a supercharger and about 163 brake horsepower. That translates, if you're interested in figures, 
to 0 to 60 in 9.3 seconds, which is quite respectable. The 180 has a 2 litre engine, and then it all gets a bit confusing because there's a 2.6 in the 230, the 3.2 litre V6 in the 320. Who cares? You're not going to remember them anyway. This is the kind of mid-range, probably one of the better sellers. And it does feel pretty strong, but it is still a Mercedes, so Sir and Modem are asked to restrain from anything that's too verging on the hooliganery. Steering and suspension have been completely revised. The old one on Mercedes used to be recirculating ball. Something that I would have thought put you in hospital, but apparently it steers your car. It's now rack and pinion, which is much better. The newly revised suspension is... Well, it's definitely on the firm side of yielding, shall we say, but that adds to the kind of sporty feeling. And whilst we're on the subject of things firm, the seats, typical Mercedes, you settle down and think, ooh, that's a bit hard. But actually, if you're on a longer journey, you will find they do start to adapt to the shape of, well, your bum, and make the whole thing a bit more comfortable for our longer trip. Another refreshing change comes in the fact that standard specification will be slightly higher than has been traditional with older Mercedes, where even wheel nuts would have cost you extra. You'll even find a six-speed manual gearbox as standard. Or you can opt for the five-speed automatic that we've got in our test car, which is, well, a little on the slushy side. Mercedes say, though, that they've answered critics of their previous manual gearboxes and their six-speeder is a lot sharper. That coupe-esque silhouette has another advantage apart from looking good. It does mean that it doesn't create as much drag, which of course in turn brings benefits in fuel consumption. Mercedes, in making their changes for the new C-Class, have dumped the old round dials, and we've got this kind of half-moon affair with a needle that cranks its way around the speedo set firmly in the middle. You wouldn't want to know about anything as vulgar as revs after all. And I'm not sure. I don't like it. I prefer round dials but that's just me. This is a crucial car for Mercedes. It's their big seller. They expect to sell thousands upon thousands of these. There's no word from Mercedes yet on prices, but expect it to be competitive. They're keeping quiet as of now, I suspect because they don't want BMW to turn around and knock a couple of hundred quid off every model and claim to be cheaper. It will sell. No doubt about it, just the three-pointed star on the front would see to that. But the difference is, this is a C-Class that you might just find desirable and not just the Tweedy set. Whereas the old one was very much a hyacinth bouquet to BMW's slinky Claudia Schiffer 3 Series, this new C-Class hits back with a naughty little Anna Kornikova. It looks a lot better and is a lot faster too. Watch out, BMW. The Toyota Land Cruiser is 50 years old. Happy birthday to you. Yep, the favoured transport of those the world over who need to conquer continents and cross deserts has reached its half century. Happy birthday to you. We could have gone to the desert, we could have tried to hack through a jungle in it, but no, we've come here to Sweden, where apparently it's a bit nippy out there. Happy birthday, Toyota Land Cruiser. Forget it. <laughs> The Amazon, <laughs> this, is the biggest version of the Land Cruiser, and it's so big that if you get in at one end and get out of the other, you'll be in a different time zone. It's enormous. Driving an Amazon anywhere is kind of a unique experience. Just the height, the width, the size, the weight of the thing. You really do find yourself looming over other roadgoers. Even big wagons don't seem quite so threatening when they come powering the other way, kicking up snow, because I'm in something that weighs very nearly as much as them. To mark the 50th anniversary of Land Cruiser, they've produced a special edition version of the Amazon. And this is it. You get a few extra bits of kits. You get a fantastic DVD navigation system, nice shiny alloy wheels, some super luxurious stinky finished leather. They're only going to be bringing 50 of them into the UK, which is quite apt. And it also apt, it costs the best part of 50 grand, 47,000 to be precise, which is a heck of a lot of cash for an off-roader. But you've really got to think of it as a very highly specified luxury car that you can climb mountains in if you want to. The Swedish have a fantastic approach to driving on snow and it goes something like this. Snow? What snow? They just take no notice. About 120 kilometers an hour, you can see this far. It's mad. But I guess it's for four or five months of the year, your entire world looks like a Christmas cake. You're gonna get used to it.
We are on proper winter tyres here, which is comforting, but the car is still shifting about a fair bit. And the unnerving thing is, yeah, sure, it's incredibly competent. The Amazon will go just about anywhere. But just the weight of the thing is so aware that if it starts to slip a bit too much offline, not a lot you're going to do to gather it all up again. It could get very messy. It is quite an unnerving feeling. I'm not going to tell the Swedes, but I'm actually a bit frightened. Right, well, it seems we're actually going to get to romp about in the snow in this thing and go a bit off-road. But first, I have to prepare my car, which means I've got to do the following. I've got to lock up the centre diff. One press of the button. That's done, thank you. I've got to put it into low-ratio gearbox. That's done, thank you. I've got to drop my aerial because I don't want to get that tangled up in any trees. There we go. Thank you. I've got to fold in my wing mirrors, which we do down here. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I'm not locking up the rear diff, which I do here yet, but if it really does get sticky out there, that'll be the last thing. It's kind of my last chance. If that doesn't work, we ain't never getting out. Right, to the snow. This is a great lesson in winter driving for somebody who only ever experiences about this much snow and everything drags to a halt. Mind you, I can't believe I haven't binned it yet. I'm just so anxious that I don't get into the wrong rut when you're driving kind of off-road on snow and start drifting towards the ditch because it is nigh on impossible to pull the thing off the trajectory it's decided that it wants to be on. And I do not want to end up in the ditch, please. Right, excellent, perfect. Just what I wanted. That's uh, just to demonstrate uh, how a perfectly straight track can lead you into terrible trouble. <laughs> I was reading the map. It's rather embarrassing. But it's all right, because there is a technique. I know what to do. You, uh, you kind of, you, and uh, you find your telephone and you call for help. How very embarrassing. Of the three coupes we've looked at so far, they all lack just one thing, class. Not as cars in themselves, more in the badge department. And that is not a problem for this car. The BMW 330ci, outside every inch the classy coupe, but it's not outside that the story lies. And that story is not just the fact that, yes, it's luxuriously appointed inside, and believe me, it is luxuriously appointed, including a telly, which is very, very nice. The really clever bit here is the gearbox. Now, listen carefully, because I don't fully understand this, so as I explain it, we're going to be learning together. It is an ordinary manual gearbox, just as you would get on any other BMW coupe. But it works automatically, sequentially. So what we're not talking about is your traditional automatic box. There are very good reasons for having a manual over that. I'll explain them in a second class if you pay attention. What we've got then is a gear lever in the usual place, and we just slide it into the middle position. There is no clutch pedal, we depress the throttle, and we pull away smoothly. Both the clutch itself and the actuation of the gears in the gearbox is carried out electro-hydraulically. That's automatically to you and me, but don't forget, not an automatic box. You've still got your standard manual gearbox. You can then change gear either by waggling the bit about in the middle as you would in a Tiptronic style gearbox or with these little paddles on the steering wheel. Okay, if you're still with me and still paying attention, one final point, that reason. Well, an automatic gearbox loses a lot of power, apart from making a rather nasty noise and being a bit lurchy and boring. You soak away a lot of the torque through the torque converter, through the actual mechanics of it. 
compared to a manual gearbox. So what we've got here is the convenience of a manual gearbox with the enormous expense and extra complication of a load of clever gubbins to change gear for you. A jet fighter might be a long way from a load lugging estate car, but this particular one can just about claim to be related because it can trace its ancestry back to a time when Saab decided to use up their spare staff by turning them from making aircraft to building cars. And as a result, their cars have always boasted the highest levels of engineering, as well as being slightly, well, quirky in a Swedish way. Then there's the second of our Swedish offerings, the Volvo. It can trace its ancestry back to, well, an old wardrobe, probably from the looks of most old Volvos. But they have built a very well-deserved reputation for constructing the most durable, long-lived and practical of estate cars on the market. Cars that have, over the generations, carried families on holiday, antique traders and travelling salesmen. And like the Saab, they seem to go on forever and ever. In some cases, the only way to age an old Volvo or a Saab is to cut a slice off the exhaust pipe and can the rings. The Saab has been on sale for about a year now. The Volvo went on sale only recently. And the difficulty for fans of Swedish cars is going to be in choosing between the two of them because they are very much pitched head to head in the marketplace. It's a case, if you like, of how do you like your Swede, sir? The first thing to hit you when you get into the Saab is just how comfortable these seats are. You really do get the impression that this aircraft is club class. Thank you very much. And that impression is bolstered by the presence of this little card that we find in the car, giving us details of the car's safety. But I keep expecting to face backwards and uh, address my passengers for where the exits are in case of emergency. Or is that just me? Good news too when it comes to the amount of kit, because they certainly don't let you down. There's more than enough luxury touches in here. The climate control is particularly easy to use and very effective. And there are some nice little touches as well, like this cup holder. Wow! Somebody's put some real thought into that. It's not just a throwaway item. For my money, certainly it's the most stylish of the two interiors and typically Saab with the instruments banked in front of you. You feel very much like you're in control of an aircraft. And one other typical Saab feature as well, the ignition key mounted down here on the transmission tunnel. They've always done it and it looks like they always will. It does mean you can lock the gearbox as well. Oh, hello. Do I hear the sound that could mean the captain's put the seatbelt warning lights on? Must be getting ready for takeoff. The Saab actually has the smaller engine of the two. It's just 2.3 litres and only four cylindered, compared to Volvo's five cylinders and 2.4. But the Saab is actually more powerful. It has an extra 30 bhp and it does feel faster than the Volvo. There's barely any turbo lag in here. And that's not surprising, really, because Saab have been fiddling around with turbos since the 70s, so you'd expect them to get it right. In fact, the only interruption in the acceleration comes from waiting for kickdown on the automatic gearbox. The best way to enjoy your 9.5 estate is to sit back, calm and unruffled. Think club class again on a long intercontinental flight. Just reserve that acceleration for takeoff and maybe a bit of overtaking. But be warned, when you do come to land, you might find the brakes are a bit of a surprise. It's not that they're not there, they are, but you will have to give the pedal a bit of a prod. There's good news in store for rear seat passengers in the Saab, because there's loads of room and it's really comfortable as well. And then the boot space. Well, it's every bit as cavernous as you would demand in any estate car in this class. But there's more to it than that, because we get this extremely nifty hard luggage cover and then this very clever system of nets and these movable anchor points to which you could tie up ships if you really felt the need to. All well and good, but surely, if it's practicality and space you want, it's got to be a Volvo. It's been that way for hundreds of years. Well, yes and no. For a start, this luggage cover... <laughs> Forget it. Horrible thing. There are anchor points, but they're only in the corners. There aren't a whole rack of them like in the Saab. There is a nice little space here. Good news for smugglers, as long as customs are particularly gullible. And that's about it. In the back, well, plenty of space for your, your passengers here. And again, it's nice and comfortable, but there could be a bit of a disappointment in store here compared to the 9.5. Everything's in here, it's just not as engaging or as special feeling as in the Saab. Now, I'm actually quite a fan of these simple, solid slabs of controls that Volvo seem to be turning out, but I know plenty of people find it, well, rather Euro-bland. 
They have been to the same school of cup holder manufacture, though. Look at this beauty. Yeah, it's the kind of thing that would finally make you talk in a torture chamber. Whatever you say. So, despite those extra cubes, the Volvo loses out on power, and it does feel quite a lot slower than the Saab. It's another light pressure turbo, and this time there is turbo lag. In fact, that seems to be the only effect of it. The turbo basically flattens the bottom end and brings no particular benefits. So it loses out in terms of power. It loses out as well when it comes to the seating position for the driver and the passenger. The seats feel flabby. They're nowhere near as firmly padded and ergonomically shaped as those of the Saab. So more points down there. Then all of a sudden, the Volvo starts to claw back points, and it does it in a most un-Volvo-like way because chuck this big barge through a series of corners and you'll be amazed. It goes round them really well, really fast. It feels glued down. The chassis is extremely well sorted for a car of this size. To chuck an estate car through a series of bends, this has got to be the one. When it comes time to draw things to a halt though, be warned again. Unlike the Saab, when you have to give the brakes a hefty prod, do the same in this and you'll be pulling your eyeballs back out of the air vents. It stops immediately. If anything, they are far too fierce. It's very difficult to be sensitive. Great news in an emergency. Bad when you pull up 30 feet short of a junction. So, rather than being just a straightforward battle between two very similar cars, it's become apparent that each of these is going to appeal to really a very different buyer. In essence, then, it boils down to this. If you need an estate car capable of hustling along your favourite stretch of B-road with the biggest payload on board, then the Volvo is your thing. But if you want a cross-continental tourer with a wonderful burst of acceleration and that cosseting ride, it's got to be the 9.5. It wins as well in terms of build quality and arguably style. So that's it. The Saab emerges top speed. Just. Let's play a little game of fantasy car making and decide what ingredients you'd need to make the perfect dream deal. Well, for me, the list is like this. It's got to look good. It's got to be well made and definitely have the right badge. It's got to have a certain degree of sporting capabilities. It's got to be able to carry me and a couple of passengers in a high level of comfort. It's got to be good value and it's got to have good resale values. Do you know, I feel like a cross between Delia Smith and Jeremy Clarkson. In a minute, I'm going to express some right-wing views while baking a souffle. Anyway, if those are the ingredients that go to make your dream deal, then I reckon I've got the ideal car, a Mercedes CLK. The Mercedes CLK has been revamped and restyled, and it cuts quite a dash. The old car was always popular with the style-conscious motorist, but lost points due to an old chassis that let the handling down. That's gone now, and the new car uses the chassis from the new C-Class, so it's off to a good start. Style-wise, it's sleeker than the old car and fits in well in the new Mercedes range. Inside, the entire new Mercedes range has marked a welcome return to form after a couple of years of slightly suspect build quality, and the new CLK is no different. It's well laid out, exceptionally well put together, and fairly spacious for a two-door coupe. Rear passengers will have to be friends though, but up front there's plenty of room. Now, if it's really to be my ideal car, then how it looks and how many people it can carry are less important than how it drives. So, just how ideal is this CLK? Let's find out. Now, with this CLK, the fun starts the minute you get in. It's sensor city. Watch this. I'm going to close the door. It sensed that. So, straight away, closes the windows, front and rear. Then I put my electronic gizmo that doubles as a key into the ignition and voila. The steering wheel goes back to the position I set it at earlier. Great stuff. Turn the ignition, senses that I'm ready to go, and there, like your very own private butler, is an arm proffering the seatbelt in a very nice butler-type way. I've put it in, and then it goes back to its original position. It sensed that I'm ready to go, so it's probably in a minute going to sense that I don't have a passenger, so the arm will go into there, and we're ready to go. Now the V6 on this engine really does make a lovely throaty rasp when you're driving it hard. Get the revs up to four, five thousand, and it's got a beautiful note. Now considering the size and performance of this car, the brakes are brilliant. 
even in the wet with the traction control and ABS systems working together, that this car really can stop very quickly. The other major niggle for me is the price of this car. This CLK320 costs about £42,000. Now, for that, you do get satellite navigation system, you do get in-car telephones, you get not one but two level of heated seats, that kind of thing. And there's switches down there that have no idea what they're for. But it's all electric, granted, and it senses it for you, obviously. I think one of them is to order the masseur to come to the car. Now, look, the car's got a very nice sensor. can sense that I'm pulling up, so I pull up stop I'm amazed I have to brake for myself car in park turn it off and then once I take my seat belt off and the key out the steering wheel goes up there we go for all you big pot-bellied German drivers the steering wheel gets out the way so you can go for your next lunch it's sense that I'm getting out it's taking the windows down a fraction very nice thanks Jeeves now, is this Merc CLK my ideal car? Well, let's go back to the original list. Badge, great build quality, superb residuals, they're all a given, it's a Mercedes. But value for money, 42 grand? I don't think so. Sporting capabilities, nowhere near enough power. Inside space, is there enough room for me and a couple of scally mates in there? Not likely. No, my ideal car is still a Volvo Estate. I'm just joking with you. Peugeot 206 GTI, the latest of the breed from the past masters of the hot hatch genre. And if heritage is anything to go by, then this should be just about the best you can buy. But what if you want an alternative to a mainstream GTI? Something a little bit different, something that will stand out from the crowd. Uh, well, be warned, it's a Proton. I know, pork pie hats on the parcel shelf and an old Mitsubishi engine clattering away up front. So to make up for its perhaps rather down market sounding badge, they've fitted it with two badges. And the second badge says Lotus, which isn't that surprising really when you consider that Proton own Lotus. So they've let the British sports car supremos loose on fettling their GTI. But have they done enough to challenge what Peugeot at least will tell you is still the original, the grandmaster, the benchmark of hot hatchery? It may well be able to trace its line directly back to one of the original small hot hatches, but the 206 GTI feels about as big as the factory that they built the original 205 in. But that said, once you are in here, it's a, a very nicely understated cabin. It does feel very well designed. There's lots of nice touches. I do like the sporty little instrument binnacle and the little chrome gear lever. So why, oh why do we have a reappearance of this awful textured plastic? It looks cheap and feels nasty and tacky. I do like the suede effect and leather though. Very sporty. I can remember the first time I saw a 205 GTI 1.9 and I was amazed that there could be an engine so big in a car so small. Well, today's top spec GTI from Persia now boasts a 2 litre engine and it'll dash from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 8.4 seconds. The ride is soft and comfortable and the controls are very light and easy to use. But hang on, this is a hot hatch. The old 205 felt like a go-kart. This begins to feel perhaps a little too grown up. The light steering could be seen to be remote and rather distant. Whereas in the 205 you felt every bump and ripple in the road through the controls, the brakes in particular on the 206, though very effective, could be operated by somebody else's feet. Overall, the 206 GTI comfy, oh yes, very, too comfy, well, possibly for some. And the price for all this comfort? Well, today's hot hatch is a long way from yesterday's, not only in size of the car, but also the bill, £14,000. You've got to admit, when you look across at the Proton, it is a bit of a surprise to discover that it is a Proton. And there's another surprise inside as well. OK, so it's a little bit garish, perhaps, but come on, this is a GTI. It's a hot hatch, that's what we want. If you want subtle and understated, go buy a Rover. If sporty little touches are your thing, though, this has got to be the place to be. It's got every single styling cue you could find on a hot hatch. Chrome gear knob, little chrome bolts and rivets everywhere, little chrome pedals down here by my muddy feet, and these spectacularly comfortable Recaro seats. Mm -hmm. 
Now this is more like it. Less powerful the Proton may be, with only 1800cc to the 206's 2 litre, and though on paper it is faster, it'll dash from 0 to 60 in 7.8 seconds, I'm not convinced. But if it's the experience we're after, then this really will bring out the hooligan in you. For a start, the Proton is loud, very loud, most of it through road noise. The steering is fast and direct with plenty of feel, and the same can be said for the brakes. Once you discover that most of the power is actually in a narrow mid-range band, then it's very easy to exploit it. It might be less luxurious than the 206, but those ultra-comfortable seats provide just the support you need on a longer journey. Mind you, if you are about to tackle a longer journey in the Proton GTI, be warned to keep an eye on the fuel gauge. It's got a range of about 25 miles, so you'll be hopping in and out of those seats a lot. It's not because the Proton is thirsty, it's just because the tank is tiny. If you're waiting for me now to tell you that the Proton costs four and a half grand less than the Peugeot, don't, because it doesn't. It actually costs 500 pounds more. And it's a mark of how far Proton have come as a manufacturer, that their hot hatch can be compared to Peugeot's without it being laughable. Even more so that it can cost more than the Peugeot and still be taken seriously. Cynics might tell you that it's also a mark of what's happened to Peugeot, that their hot hatch can be compared to any Proton at all. In fact, the 206 is as large, as comfortable and sophisticated as you could possibly want from a car in its class. The baby Proton is loud, brash and raucous and every inch a hot hatch in the traditional sense. And if you're still having a little bit of a snigger, here's one further little bit of food for thought. Think about this, the Talbot Horizon and the Cortina. Pretty humdrum cars, neither of them worth peanuts second hand until Lotus became involved. Then, hey ho, instant classic. Who knows? Ooh, this is going to be a bloody one. So the hot hatches bicker amongst themselves as to who can shave an extra tenth of a second off the Nauta 60 time. And the big luxury barges bicker of the benefits of certain nerve over a seat massager. But this is where the real battle takes place. Here between these middle class, mid range, middle lane motorway mile munchers, both reps chariots and both from manufacturers hungry for your tick in the box next to their motor on the company car lists. So we have the BMW 318SE and facing up to it, still fresh and youthful, the new Mercedes C180, both only a couple of steps up from cooking versions of the basic cars. Mercedes are after BMW's championship belt and they look like they mean business. They both look great, both are hand carved from one lump of granite and will last thousands of years. Mileages to raise the eyebrow of a spaceship captain will be perfectly achievable without anything ever going wrong. Well, more or less, but we've got to choose between them. So let battle commence. Mercedes used to have a reputation for being incredibly mean. It was all you could do to get a key fob out of them. But when you bought what is still an expensive car, now though they've addressed that and clearly they've been tracking BMW with this the C-Class because the spec is very similar. In this fairly basic version we get pretty much everything you need as standard. I've got a multi-function steering wheel that allows me to control the telephone and the radio and bits and pieces like that. A fairly elaborate and clever automatic climate control. Cruise control is standard. They have their stability control system to keep things on the straight and narrow. And so to the BMW 318 where we get, oh look! cruise control and automatic climate control and elaborate stereo. It does feel sharp and eager, but it doesn't exactly feel exciting. In this lesser powered version, it feels perhaps a little bit numb. The gearbox isn't exactly exhilarating. We've only got five speeds as opposed to the six in the Mercedes C-Class. It probably doesn't feel as sharp as the BMW. Mercedes seldom do. But considering it is a small Mercedes, it is a huge improvement on old ones and still a good car to drive. 
The huge discounts given to big corporate buyers are, of course, denied the humble private buyer, but that's another story. The result is that though margins may be squeezed to the bone, the numbers sold are huge. For what it's worth, not that many people will be digging into their own pockets to buy these things, the BMW costs £20,130 in this form. Bear in mind it is slightly better equipped than the Mercedes C180 Classic, which chips in at a slightly more weighty £20,740, both on the road. The BMW is still excellent. It looks great, it's still good to drive, it's got everything you need on board. The problem is, quite a lot of people seem to agree with you, and the old blue and white propeller badge is in danger of becoming a victim of its own success. They made them so good, everybody bought the things, and now, well, in some parts of the world, they could be seen as a little bit common. Oh dear. Whereas the Mercedes, well, that's an entirely different prospect. Pitching up for your full o'clock in Wigan, peering at the world through the three-pointed star at the end of the bonnet, might just help you stand out from the crowd a little. Sure, it's not ultimately as fast and sharp handling as the BMW, but the payoff is less crashing suspension and a far more comfortable ride. Half a million BMW 3 Series were sold a couple of years ago in 1999. That's a lot. Now, it might deny you any chances of exclusivity, but it is an indication that BMW must be doing something right. With their new C-Class, Mercedes want those sales, if not all of them, then quite a lot of them. And they deserve them. We'll see what happens.